we have one more keynote session today with Keith Adams discussing scaling technology influence at Slack. Who's excited? Yes, wonderful. So I think you'd be hard pressed to find somebody in here who is unfamiliar with the communication tool Slack. Uh, Keith Adams is the chief architect uh, and has presided over that for three years of hyper growth in usage, code base, and headcount. As the chief architect, he's been assisting with the engineering and tech leaders with their tech selection, build by decisions, capacity planning, project slicing and sequencing, and large scale system design. Prior, he was a senior engineer at Facebook and VMware, and he has 12 US patents in computing. Please welcome to the stage, Keith Adams. All right, cool. Thank you for that intro, Patrick. Uh, my name's Keith. Uh, like Patrick told you, I've been at Slack for about three years. Um, that's a really kind of uh, blockbuster sounding intro. So uh, the FAQ about the chief architect role, since a lot of places don't have such a role, uh, I got frequently asked, you know, what's that like? Um, and on a bad day, it's, uh, it's kind of like, ooh, clicker, there we go. It's kind of like this. Um, I'm dating myself a little bit here with the reference for those that aren't sort of Simpsons aficionados. Um, the joke is that he's not helping. Uh, there's two reasons he's not helping. One is that Ralph is a sort of silly character, so whatever he's saying probably isn't that helpful. But he's also holding a banana instead of a telephone, um, right? So there's no actual possible way he could be helping. So the way that my role at Slack currently works is that I don't have any direct reports, and it's increasingly the case that I can't really just do things all by my lonesome, trying to code or trying to review others' code and so on all by myself. And so uh, every once in a while I feel a little bit like Ralph here. The joke, by the way, I can't take credit for the joke, like naming the file chiefarchitect.jpg was my colleague Josh Wills at Slack who did, did this as a bit of good natured ribbing for me in the uh, popular communications tool Slack, which we use at the company Slack. And uh, I gotta give him credit for it. This, this sort of feels like a really perfect, perfectly pitched uh, version of my uh, inner imposter syndrome here. And we'll, we'll be returning to this throughout the talk. So I'm glad you paged this all in. So when I first started at Slack about three years ago, uh, the place was small enough that I could kind of just try to transplant my skills from being a tech lead. Right? I'd been running, uh, you know, as a, as a senior engineer, I'd been working as part of a team, you know, in sort of dozens to, to scores of engineers for a while. And Slack wasn't so far off that scale that I couldn't, couldn't try to just, you know, riff in that venue uh, at Slack as well. So I tried to write some code. Um, that kind of worked to some extent. I tried to review other people's code, and that also kind of worked to some extent. Um, I did a bunch of one-on-ones with, with tech leads and other teams. Uh, to some extent, introduced processes. Um, and also did a bunch of, you know, natural language communication, right? And that included, you know, writing things in Slack and keeping up with, with the sort of real-time stuff. But also long-form things, um, you know, writing for internal and external audiences. Doing talks kind of like this one, um, although usually with more computer content than this one. A little out over my skis doing a pure leadership talk here. So, uh, wish me luck. Writing blog posts and so on. And uh, these things more or less uh, started to break down as you head, to, and as you head down the page, more and more of the bottom of the page started to stick. So um, if I tried to draw, a th thread a needle through the things that worked and the things that didn't work, that needle seems to be narrative, like narrative structure. People actually have story-shaped holes in their heads, and if you fail to fill those holes, first of all, other things will fill them. Um, and secondly, if whatever information you're trying to get across is just not going to get stick or get distorted in some weird way. And when I say stories, for some, sometimes people uh, think that I mean like literally fiction or you know completely uh, blue sky nonsense. Um, the technological stories we're talking about here are still grounded in reality. They're still about teams. They're about the artifacts teams build together. They're grounded in data. They have to sort of be consistent with reality as we experience it. Um, and that makes us a little bit different than just, you know, saying that they should fire me and hire a filmmaker or something. But um, I want to talk about a signal processing concept called gain and how this affects sort of narrative effectiveness, right? So a uh, goofy hobby I have, I play electric guitar. And every component in the signal chain of, of an electric guitar, you're going to look at the gain of that chunk of the signal chain. And the gain is basically a factor that uh, multiplies the amplitude of the input into its output. And there's a really big difference between gains under one and gains over one, right? So gains under one, basically things kind of fade out into the distance. Gains over one, they saturate, right? 
they kind of explode as you go farther and farther. And as your org gets so big that you can't directly influence people one-on-one um, -on -one all the time, this gain factor for a message becomes really important. All right, so imagine I have a one-on-one -on -one with, uh, with somebody I've anonymized lightly to, to A here. All right, they're a tech lead of some sort of team. Um, and I do a really crummy job conveying an idea to them. And I give them that idea in a way that has a gain factor of just 0.2. Um, a good example of a, of a way of conveying an idea that just has gain factor 0.2 is telling somebody to do something. Right? So somebody's explaining, I want to do this, this, and this. And I say, use gRPC. I don't give you a good reason to use gRPC. Maybe you've got some reason you were going to use Thrift that you're like anxious about communicating to me. Um, but that's a message that's going to be really imperfectly communicated. So <laughs> let's say I get it across to them and they understand it. Um, if they only have sort of a 20% chance of explaining it to anybody else, it sort of makes its way a little bit out into the larger tissue of the company um, and stops. Right? So that was a banana phone that I was talking into when I tried to communicate this to somebody that way. Um, and I might have a perfectly valid reason for wanting them to use gRPC in this case, or it turns out there's actually a big narrative around how we need to get to a service mesh, and that means that we're going to need to have our service mesh understand the RPC framework we're using, and we've standardized on gRPC because dozens of other things have already used it, and because it, you know, we like the momentum of it, and blah, blah, blah. Um, but unless I actually draw that picture for them, it's not going to make any particular sense. Um, a great example of things that tend to have really high gain, by the way, are jokes and rumors, right? <laughs> So jokes and rumors are kind of degenerate cases of stories. They have the kind of coarse structure of a story. They have protagonists, they have a beginning, they have a middle, they have an end. Um, and they have a really big payoff because they're really short. Right? So jokes are funny. Right? They have some juxtaposition they're making that feels insightful, feels fun. Uh, rumors feel like they're privileged information. Right? They feel like they're secret information so that it has a really big payoff to, to spread a rumor. You feel like you've shared something really valuable with someone. Um, and those are good examples of sort of the gap fillers that end up making the space up if you don't fill it with sort of conscious stories. Okay, so that could have been about anything, but I work in a, a technology company and we're busy trying to deliver complicated technical products. And technical stories uh, have a little bit of, a, of more of a set of constraints on them than stories for, you know, a series on Netflix or something. Um, for one thing, these are, these are true, right? The, our goal here is not to invent some sort of fictional reality for us all to inhabit collectively. I'm not trying to bring Slack down into some collective hallucination or something. Um, these stories have to be consistent with the facts as we know them, and hopefully are, are a decent predictor of the future. These things also aren't necessarily long-form text, right? You can tell stories in one-on-ones, you can tell stories in Slack messages, you can tell stories uh, in talks, you can tell stories in the form of uh, of films and so on, as, as we're all familiar with. Um, and I want to, to, to double down on the sort of idea here that this is one of those things where, you know, a younger version of me, right, who uh, was sort of a technologist first and, and mostly interested in technological uh, improvements to the, to the work that my company was doing, I'd have been rolling my eyes like pretty hard at this point in the talk here. So. Um, let me try and convince you that even if you are not interested in stories, stories are interested in you. So, um, like it or not, there are story-shaped holes in your head and in the heads of everybody you work with. And if you do not choose to fill them with something, something will fill them anyway. Um, and usually what will fill them is, is something I've come to call default stories. Um, default stories are kind of crummy stories. They're not very interesting. You would never go see a play that had the plot from a default story. Um, it's, it's usually really cartoonish. Your brain kind of constructs it without, before you're even aware you've constructed it. Sometimes they're sort of so simple you'd be embarrassed to say them out loud. Um, and even though they're not being verbally said out loud, you kind of return to it over and over again. And the good news with default stories is that if we actually put some effort into improving upon them, they're actually pretty easy to displace. But you have to actually do the work to displace them. Um, so some concrete examples of this. Um, first of all, imposter syndrome is kind of a, a great example of a default story. Right? I don't often say aloud to somebody, you know, the thing I did didn't work because I'm terrible at my job. Right? But of course, that's a thought that you kind of go to as a default thought pretty often. Um, humans are very status conscious. Right? That's not because your company has a terrible con you know, culture or something like that. Just humans are aware of, of signals of status, and promotions are one of those signals of status. 
And if your promotion process isn't transparent, or if it seems unfair, or if you do not have an active story around the organizational change that you just made, people will supply a story. And it will be one of these dumb stories. It'll be that Eric got the promotion because he knows the founders, or because whatever, right? Um, they're often, uh, you know, because human beings by default are also a little bit narcissistic, um, they're often really self-centered, right? So if uh, nobody is offering you a story about how your work actually fits into the broader context of your company, it's really easy to convince yourself nobody gets like how this place would fall apart if, if I wasn't here. And another reason that, that engineers tend to sort of uh, resist the notion of storytelling being an important part of their job is that they'd like to believe that they're um, fact-driven, right? They'd like to believe that they're not driven by narratives, they're driven by reality. And I want to highlight here that reality doesn't actually uniquely determine a story, right? You can make up lots of different stories for a given set of facts. Um, I feel bad putting this on a slide, but it's just a useful example. You know, knock on wood, uh, Last I checked, Slack's business is doing pretty well, right? And a story that you might tell yourself if you don't think very hard about this is, cool, we're successful, we did it. Um, you know, we're this, this SaaS business, we've got a nice little niche going, you know, revenue is more than I thought it would be, the number of customers is more than I thought it would be, the usage is more than I thought it would be, fantastic, let's return our money to our investors and uh, not screw anything up. So let's kind of play to, to keep things on the rails. A different story that you can use with that same fact um, is actually, well, you know, what's Slack for? It's for all the stuff that email is for and then a few other things. So if you think about all the people who use email at work, we've still got a lot of work to do actually. Um, sure, we've come a long way, but we're certainly not 10% of the way there and we're probably not actually 1% of the way there. So we need to be pretty solidly into that kind of hyperscale territory and actually a territory that, as far as I know, only consumer companies have really gone into. So we've got to do, um, we've got to build an enterprise software product that actually has a, a consumer level of adoption. And that's pretty sobering. And there's a lot more work to do. And the point about this is that these two stories lead to really different plans, really different activities, really different sets of decisions people make, right? Imagine, um, Imagine I had total decision-making authority about every technology choice that happens at Slack for the sake of discussion. And imagine I'm way smarter than I am and I have way more context than I actually do, so I actually make all those decisions perfectly. It's not, it's not even a problem that I make the wrong decisions. I can make the, all the right calls all day long. Um, I'm still only able to make maybe a decision every 30 seconds from dawn to dusk. Um, that still isn't going to scale as well as an entire organization that actually is aligned around a context like this, that actually understands that, oh, the first story is not the story, the second story is the story. Um, and that's going to offload a lot of decision making to other people. Oopsie. A slightly more tactical one. This is also from, from Slack's actual history. Um, we had a bunch of problems with iOS client reliability a year and a half ago. Um, it just seemed like it got worse with every release. If you looked at the postmortems from you know, which sort of stack traces they were, there were just a thousand different stack traces. It wasn't like this was all happening in one place or there was just one bug to fix. Um, and the kind of fear, the fear driven narrative around that would be, um, oh, this is a total mess. It's all technical debt. It's been a million layers of spaghetti wrapped around a million other layers of spaghetti. Uh, let's just throw the darn thing out and start over again. Um, if you kind of can apply a little bit more context and a little bit more of a, a long term view of this, yeah, there's lots of different stack traces, but you know, it turns out that most of them had something to do with the racy data access, it feels like. So maybe there are a few judiciously applied synchronization practices we could you know, put into the code base that would actually clean up a lot of these. Um, in practice, that latter one was a way more fruitful avenue to, uh, to investigate for us. And uh, our iOS client is not perfect, but its stability is uh, orders of magnitude better than it was at that time. A property of the technical stories that I think are really effective are that they satisfy curiosity in a technical sense. There's a, a German AI researcher named Jürgen Schmidhuber who has a beautiful definition of curiosity that deserves to be more influential. It should be more well known outside of AI. Because um, curiosity isn't just a desire to acquire facts, right? Because reality is full of stupid facts, right? Reality is full of facts about like 
how many holes there are on this microphone screen and how many you know holes there are on the acoustic tile on the top of the and, and people who are fascinated in that we don't think of them as curious we think of them as like mentally defective right fixated on something that's useless the curiosity we care about is the is the facts that help us compress our history so curiosity is the desire to obtain new information that lets you rewrite what you already know shorter um, and I think those are the kinds of stories that we're looking to construct here. So these aren't, you know, this is not purely imaginative work. Um, this isn't sort of about dragons and wizards and so forth. Um, this is about the facts that we deal with every day. It's just that it has the structure of narrative. Another kind of example of something that doesn't work real quick is, uh, is the hyperbolic style of the storytelling, right? The storytelling that says, like, what are we doing? We are changing humanity, right? So. This is not Hooli's new storage appliance, right? This is a revolution in the way that human beings communicate and share information with each other and get their jobs done, right? What's hilarious about Silicon Valley, the, the HBO series at some level, is that they really have that pitch perfect ear for that hyperbolic version of this storytelling. Um, people get exhausted with that kind of storytelling. You need to be realistic about it. And it's tough to strike a balance between the importance of what we do and not going full hyperbole, right? So. Slack really might change the way lots and lots of people do their jobs, and that's really important, and it's really worth a great effort, but it is not negotiating with aliens for the future of Earth. A whole bunch of stuff I don't have room for in here. All of the narrative structure applies. People who, who tell stories for a living know a lot of things that we tend not to know about how you tell good stories. Um, and this is probably unique to the tech industry, right? Or the newspaper industry, everybody who's running those companies was a storyteller at some point, so they know a lot of these things. Um, so to try and take my own medicine here, I did this talk as if it were a tech talk without a big story. So let me give you a narrative, that, a narrative version of, of my journey through the material in this talk, right? So somebody who uh, is a know-it-all programmer who thinks they're really hot stuff, takes a new job with a very different role, uh, and finds out that his film major friends actually know everything he needs to know in this new role. Um, and while that might not be, you know, the most amazing story necessarily, Notice how much more easily that compresses into your brain than the whole list of things I just went through. Cool, and with that, I'd be happy to take some questions. Thank you so much, Keith. Um, first question, what are your thoughts on a chief, ar chief architect having direct reports or not? Uh, I think there's different ways to do it. I, think, I don't think there's a sort of hard and fast requirement that the role has to not have direct reports. Um, we have other people at Slack. So Johnny Rogers is our product architect. Uh, he has direct reports, and um, they help him provide some execution muscle as well. Um, I think it's a little bit like kind of amplifying the part of my job that is writing code. Like, I still do do all that stuff. I still do write code. I still do one-on-ones. I still review code. Um, I sure wish I had 80 more hours in a week to do those things. And you know, I think it's kind of a matter of resourcing. So I'm not philosophically against chief architects ever having direct reports, um, but if they do, I think the kind of um, the way that you'd evaluate that chunk of that little chunk of the org would be a little bit different than the way that you'd evaluate, you know, a product-facing chunk of the org. Um, Thank you. Um, the next question: An earlier talk described Slack as product-driven. Have you faced any challenges persuading the product team that you're not just Ralph with a banana phone? That's a that's a good question. Um, so I am not, uh, I don't view myself as having deep product insight in the world, right? I don't think that's actually why I got this job. I don't think that's the, the value that I bring to Slack. Um, you know, part of Slack's founding team was Stuart Butterfield. Um, he's, one of the reasons I came to Slack was that I felt that Stuart has product alpha, like actually has non-trivial insight into what to build uh, in a way that is actually very rare. Um, so to some extent I have, uh, have I faced any challenges persuading? Yes, and correctly so. Because uh, some of the time, I am Ralph with a banana phone when I'm insisting that the product team should build X, Y, or Z. Um, but I enjoy great relationships with my colleagues in products. And uh, usually, nine times out of 10, uh, they've thought a lot more deeply than I have about whatever product decisions we're making. And it turns out to be a ton more nuanced than I, than I usually expect. Uh, every once in a great while, I have an idea that's OK. And they you know, either say, yeah, here's where it is on the roadmap. Um, or they say, oh, okay, cool, we'll figure out how to get some muscle behind that. Um, but no, I don't think that's been a sort of huge part of the challenge so far. Awesome, and we have time for, for one more question. So we have, cool. we have two up there, so I'll have you dealer's choice. Okay, uh, let's see. 
Um, I guess I will try the first one. How much of the technology decisions do you think you're influencing and what is good enough influence? Um, so unfortunately, I, you know, this is sort of one of the end-to-end -end problems of this role is like, how do you tell whether I'm doing a good job? And I don't have a wonderful answer for you about how I'm doing a good job. I can tell you how I can tell I'm doing a bad job. All right, so I am doing a bad job if Slack is failing for technical reasons, right? If Slack is not able to meet the challenges of its business and the things that its customers require um, because the service is too expensive to run or it's too unreliable or it performs too poorly or the clients crash too often or it's too impossible to release features and so on. Um, I think that uh, the right amount of influence is sort of a tricky thing. We have a lot of other smart people and the goal isn't to kind of uh, you know, mold a little army of clones or something like that. Um, they're, you know, those other smart people know things I don't know. That's why they're in the roles that they're in. Um, I, you know, the, the example before about iOS clients, right, that wasn't some sort of insight I had, right? That was insights that the tech leads and uh, who are working on client software were able to have. Um, so I think the goal is not sort of total influence over every decision or to make every decision exactly as I would have. Uh, the goal is more to kind of have a context and a plot that we're all following together um, that enables people to use their own knowledge. So, that feels like a decent answer. Let's give Keith a round of applause. Right on. Thank you.